a competing firm because he didn't want anybody to do to him what he did to Bruce. <laughs> and when three of us as partners in the London office decided in 1983 to split off and form uh, what, was, what became known as LEK, we were hit by a massive lawsuit by Bill. Uh, we just basically quite ruthlessly tried to put us out of business. And uh, I mean, it's, an it's another story, but, but you know, there was no real malice in it. He just didn't want to encourage the others. He wanted, rather wanted to discourage the others from actually even contemplating this. And we very nearly went out of business in the first two or three months under the effect of the, the lawsuit. Um, but we found a way around that. Um, but you've got to be very clear that these people are in a subordinate role. I've seen the other mode, which is partnership. When the three of us started LEK, we were partners, not quite equal partners, almost equal partners in terms of the equity that we had. But we certainly thought of ourselves as being um, partners together. And I tell you, that is a model which is fraught with great danger. The reason it's fraught with great, great danger is that if the boundaries between people are not absolutely crystal clear, there's always a human tension, human uh, desire to actually become the first amongst equals or whatever. There's a natural desire to push as far as possible. And, for example, one of the three partners, a guy called Ian Evans, was brilliant at selling particular types of work and doing particular types of work, cost reduction and competitive analysis. And he got to the stage where he was responsible for about half of the revenues of the firm, and Jim Lawrence and I were responsible for the other half. Well, naturally, Ian tried to get it so that he had a larger share of the equity. I mean, he deserved it in a way. But we were constrained by the partnership agreement, which said we had a certain fixed percentage of the ownership of the company and of the fruits of the company. So partnership is, sounds wonderful, sounds very equal, it's very democratic, it's very nice, but it's really, really, really difficult. And if you go into a partnership, don't go into a partnership with two other people, so that the three of you, or don't go into a partnership of five, because it was always true. It was like 1984. No, not 1984. Yes, 1984, where you remember in George Orwell's novel written in 1948, the world was divided into three power blocks, and Eurasia was always palling up with Atlantica and so on and so forth against the third one, and then they'd swap sides, you know, a bit like the Nazi-Soviet um, pact. And, you know, Ian and I were always ganging up against Jim, and when we got bored of that, Jim and I would be ganging up against Ian to try and stop him getting more money because he had more, more, more clients and all the rest of it. So a partnership structure is a really, really difficult structure to actually, to actually endure over time without consuming an enormous amount of internal energy for totally uh, unproductive purposes of self-aggrandizement, essentially. Um, and it's not meritocratic. It's not actually fair. You can set up a legal partnership structure and have the partners decide each year what the profit split will be. But again, that leads to quite a lot of politics as well. So I like the structure of disciples. I like it because it's easier to tell somebody to do something and make incredibly demanding requests on them if it is clear that they don't have any choice and that's what they've got to do. Uh, so, disciples is one particular way of doing it. What about the pyramid? Um, ah, I can put it in red if I move on to the next slide. Yes, there we go, pyramid. So, forget about the others. Pyramid. What's a pyramid? A pyramid is the idea that you should never do something yourself. Very consistent with the 80-20 principle. You should never do something yourself if a lower cost resource i.e. person, could actually do it themselves. So in other words, you, you divide up your functions into everything, and you always get somebody who's less experienced, less expensive, and um, less demanding to actually do the stuff that you don't want to do and that they can do. 
Now, obviously, they might not do it as well as you to start with. They might not do it as quickly as you. But the difference in cost between you doing it and them doing it is so great that actually it's a good idea to get them to do it. So it's an extreme form of delegation, if you like, but very, very um, meticulous in the sense that um, you never, ever did anything that somebody else could do. You never got your lunch, you know, if you wanted to go and have a sandwich, etc. and unless you wanted to, to, you know, just wander around because you've, you felt like it, you would always get someone, a lower-cost resource, and if it wasn't a secretary around to do it, you'd get the next layer down professionals, and then they would get the next layer down to do it. It sounds like an exploitative system, and a pyramid does look a little bit like a pyramid, you know, like the... <laughs> I mean, they, those, those things were built by slaves, and they were operated in slave, slave society. But wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I've never had such a nice life as I had in Bain and Company, uh, because in any case, we had a pyramid, but it wasn't quite as ruthless a pyramid as the Bain and Company one. Well, I never did anything I didn't want to do, and there was always someone, a slave, further down who would, who would do it. But it was good for the slaves as well. <laughs> I sincerely believe it was good for the slaves because they got to do some of my job. And increasingly, their job resembled my job. Not quite, but almost. And, um, and that's a pyramid. I mean, you do it throughout the organization, and it becomes, uh, it becomes, it sounds a bit artificial to start with, but it becomes second nature after a period of time. And um, it's, it's, a diff it's different from having disciples because the disciples basically take care of... Uh, it's disciples are sort of one level down and then whatever they do is up to them. But the pyramid is much more continuous. Uh, it sort of well, it looks like a pyramid. It sort of gradually goes down to the bottom. So that's another way of setting up the organisation so that you don't have to do very much because who's at the top of the organisation? You are. And you see that little thing at the top, which is called an apex? There ain't nothing there. <laughs> nothing to do, anyway. OK, the third way. Ah, this is a pyramid. LEK was a bit of a pyramid, and it was organized by office from that point of view. And the proof that it was a bit of a pyramid is that all these people look like they're teenagers or whatever. These, <laughs> these were the relatively senior people in LEK. And another example of the pyramid, um, about uh, 15 months ago, a guy who was an experienced property developer in London came to see me and said, I've read the 80-20 book, uh, and I want, to set up a, um, I want to set up a property development business, and why don't I do it, and I'll do everything, and you don't need to do anything apart from provide money, and um, let's start this business. So I thought, yeah, he's a pretty smart guy. And he was very persuasive, and he had a good plan and all the rest of it. I met him once for breakfast at the REC Club in Pall Mall in London. And uh, we had breakfast together for about an hour. And then I said to him, the problem is, I've got some money, that's fine, and I quite like your ideas, etc. But I can't afford to spend any time on this. I haven't got the time to do it. So what I will do is I'll ask a friend of mine, who is a guy who has run businesses, whereas I couldn't run a business to save my life, so that was suitable. And that's the guy on the left there, a guy called Justin Walters. And he will spend a little bit of his time on this, and in fact he ended up spending something like a day or two a month on this business. And then you guys basically have a pyramid within your organisation. So I was saying this is the way that we're going to organise it. So I can actually make the investment, but not have to do any of the work, not even have to do any of the thinking about it, because my mate Justin, who was a guy that I knew who was actually, who is cleverer than I am, he really is, he's a fellow of All Souls Oxford um, in his uh, spare time, um, absolutely brilliant, genius guy, can run companies, but he spends a little bit of his time on it. And now this business from nothing um, has a gross development value of about 35 million pounds at the moment. So what's that? That's about 80 
sorry, that's about $55 million, something like that. So from, from start from scratch, and it's growing at 100% a year, etc. Last year, it made 80% return on capital, 8-0, helped by the very strong property market in London, which went up by 22%. But even so, very, very profitable business. We just hope it can continue like that. But that is organized explicitly as a pyramid. And their strap line is homes to make you happy. So what they do is they take large Victorian houses and they split them into about eight apartments and they look nice like that. And homes to make you happy and homes to make us happy because it's very profitable as well. <laughs> okay. Cloning. Cl the idea behind cloning is that you train somebody to do something that you can do so that they do it as well as you or better than you, and increasingly you turn it over to them. So this is different from a pyramid or disciples because it's more like an apprenticeship system where you, you train people but, and increasingly over time they take on more and more of what it is that you do. So you might be a brilliant copywriter where you train someone who can be an even more brilliant copywriter, etc. And progressively, they do more and more of your business. And I'm going to ask Perry to talk about this, because you've done this, or you're doing this. Is that right? Um, yes. So, um, you know, um, we talked about the, you know, the, the addiction thing. So about three years ago, um, Paul Limburg had a conversation with me. And he goes, um, he goes, so, so Perry, do you think CEOs die at age 55 of a heart attack? And I go, yeah, probably they do. And he goes, nope. Operations managers die <laughs> at age uh, 55 of a heart attack. CEOs don't take stress. They give stress. Okay. Now... Th this is an important thing to talk about because Planet Perry is a very nice place, right? We're all very nice to each other and, you know, you're all very nice to your friends at the table and all this kind of stuff. But, um, you know, when you run a company, sometimes, like, stuff's got to get done, right? And so Paul starts talking to me. He goes, you need to get rid of your email box, okay? And... Um, and like I, I can I can just I, I can feel the nicotine addiction, you know. Um, like what well, this is me, this is my reputation, this is my voice. And he he calmly, methodically talks me through splitting my email box in half and giving about ninety percent of it to Lorena, you know. And she at the time was a girl that came in and changed the furnace filters and did a few other things, but. Turned out she, she was good, about, good at that, and he talked me all through it. And the, fir the first time we actually ran through, it was like, oh, my goodness, I should have done this like three years ago. Um, I basically saved myself two or three hours a day. Well, this year I've basically done that with John Fancher with writing emails, okay? So, you know, on any particular email, you don't know whether it was me or John, and we don't say... Okay, but the truth is, it's more often from, John, where are you? John, stand up. So, J John, is, John is actually me quite often. <laughs> I, have, I have cloned myself. Yeah. And, okay, and, and um, you know, we sit down and talk once a week, but I keep compressing, 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 so that I can do less and less and less and get more and more done. So, like, between the two things I just told you, I probably bought myself five hours a day, okay? And, um, you know, um, uh, Richard, I don't know if this is your phrase or somebody else, action drives out thought. Who said that? Bill Bain. Okay, Bill action Lee. drives out thought. Now, one of the things you're going to get from this weekend is, is an entire cultural shift, okay? Now, y'all come from a lot of different places, but the majority of you, you know, you're sort of, kind of, 
you're all sort of kind of seminar junkies and marketing junkies and online, you know, and all that, okay? So most people in this room have in common. And, and so if, if you're in that environment, if you're like a good estudiante, um, you go to the seminar and you take notes and then you go do all this shit, right? If you're any good, you go home and you do it. In fact, I, I had a roundtable member, um, great, great guy, um, uh, and he, he kind of drifts in and out, and, and I haven't seen him in a couple years, but uh, he, he, he had an office in this building, um, John Tamura. I uh, had an office in this building where there was some bathroom that nobody ever used, and he's very ADHD, and so he figured out that he, he could just sit on the commode with, <laughs> with the, 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 the lid on the seat closed, and he could put on his earmuffs so he couldn't hear anything, and he could just sit there, he could just do all this stuff. So he'd like, he would go to a seminar, and then he would go to his office, and he would lock himself in this bathroom that nobody goes into, and like for four hours, he would just, you know, relentlessly implement all this stuff, okay? And a and, and super productive guy, and he grew his business, and a lot of you know him, great guy. Um, well, here's, here's what the cultural shift is. Your job is actually to go home and get somebody else to do it. Now, you can't believe how much wider your brain is open to learning when you know that you don't have to punish yourself by doing everything that they just taught you how to do at the seminar. You could go to three times as many seminars if you want to <laughs> and have a third as much stress if you have other people that do the stuff. Okay, now, you know, marketing skills, I mean, how, how many of you, your business or your company is primarily a marketing-driven thing? Hands up, okay? Not surprised, probably half the room, okay? Do you realize that direct marketing is now a commodity? I mean, I gave this talk at the, Titan, uh, at the Titans of Direct Marketing event um, in, in Connecticut the other day uh, with Dan Kennedy and Jay Abraham and Joe Sugarman and Brian Kurtz and all these guys. And I got up and said, you know, I'm going to piss people off here. I said, you know, this is like a good old boys club. You know, like, that's what this is. These are the good old boys. And you know what? You need good old boys. And guess what? Like, I'm one of them now. You know, I was the renegade. You know, you could go Google the pictures from two, 1997, and Perry's like, you know, you know. Um, it's like, well, now we are the establishment, right? Well, the, the fact that there is now an establishment, and it's trained tens of thousands of people to do things like pay-per-click and copywriting and split testing and Google Analytics and all this stuff. You know what that means? That means you can hire this stuff and you don't have to do it. Okay, why are you at a $7,500 seminar? And hey, you know, congratulations to y'all for coughing up the money and you know, schlepping yourself across oceans or however, whatever you had to do, okay, you're here to, so you're here to be an alchemist. What do alchemists do? They turn lead into gold. How do they do that? Well, they build some kind of factory. You stick lead in on one end and gold in on the other. They're not sitting there with tweezers rearranging molecules. Here, I'm going to move these electrons and these protons, and you're right. No, that's, that's not what they do, okay? It's thinking, okay? And action drives out thought, okay? So you're not supposed to go home and do... You're, you're supposed to change yourself on the inside. That's your job to where you can get your, you know, nicotine, you know... I need to fix, I need to do this work, I need to make, feel, make myself feel important, take yourself out of it. I now spend two or three hours a day thinking. It's like the hardest work that you do, right? How are you going to reinvent industries? How are you going to reinvent entire businesses? So guess what? 
So 1918, Claude Hopkins shows up and he writes scientific advertising. He's like, this is the science of advertising. You know, you, 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 you set up the test and you do the hypothesis and you measure the stuff and you write the copy and you get the results and you turn the crank, right? He's like, you know, basically in the book he goes, we've got it all figured out now, you know? Well, then there was a 90-year detour and it was called Brand Advertising by Madison Avenue, okay? And so, how does that work? It works just like the United Nations. You have, you have expensive breakfasts and PowerPoint presentations, people who take credit when everything goes good and blame somebody else when everything goes bad, and um, make, send somebody the bill. Like, that's what they do, right? And so this reigned for 90 years. Then the internet came along and everything became measurable and accountable. And for probably five or 10 years, if you knew scientific advertising, if you'd gone to you know, the J. Abraham or Dan Kennedy School of Marketing, you could walk into any company and you could like do, 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 like do three or four things and like you are walking on water, you are the Messiah, right? Well, guess what, you know? Now like everybody knows that. Everybody, right Paris? Everybody knows split testing and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay, so that means if your only differentiator is that you, you're a little bit smarter of a marketer than somebody else, and it's you, then guess what? You're in the squirrel cage, and it's you, right? And now you're trying to race your squirrel cage faster than the other, you know, or hamster wheels, you know, faster than the other guy. What does that mean you need to do? You need to reinvent your industry. Okay, so what are you learning today? Today, today you're learning how to create the mental space that becomes a, a systemic environment that allows you to find the breakthrough. You know, your brain is like a search engine. You put a question in the brain and it won't stop, okay? You give somebody an answer, it'll evaporate in like 10 minutes. They won't even remember. You ask somebody a penetrating question, it'll burn a hole in their brain for years, right? Okay, so day one, how do you create a space where you can ask your brain the penetrating questions, right? Day two, where do you position yourself for a breakthrough? Where do you position yourself? This is where there's gonna be a huge exponential growth poised to happen, okay? Day three, what question do you ask yourself so that the alchemy moment actually happens? What questions do you ask yourself as an alchemist, okay? So how many of you, you know, you'll admit it, Alcoholics Anonymous, I am in a squirrel cage. I admitted my, I admitted my helplessness to my, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I almost meant, I, I should have, maybe, maybe by the end of the seminar, we'll actually have a 12 step for squirrel cage. <laughs> maybe we can write one up. Maybe one, uh, how about one of you guys just, you know, during lunch or something, you can rewrite the 12 steps and, you know, come and tell us and we'll, we'll put them up on the screen, the 12 steps for hamster wheel addicts, right? But well, makes you feel important, right? Well, you know, who's got, who's got that problem more than a guru? Oh, the world revolves around me. I have a seminar, there's a tsunami, and there's, there's another tsunami, and then the, then the FAA building burns down. The world must revolve around me, right? So, so I've, so I've cl cloned myself, cloned myself, cloned myself. I'm sitting back there with my notebook going, how else can I clone myself? How else can I, can I clone myself? Why? Because we gotta, we got to solve the real problems. You know, solving problems that Claude Hopkins solved in 1918 will only inch you forward. Richard, is there any, anything else that you wanted me to try to? Not yet.